Um, it's not a lack of nice. I really, I just, I really, really, really want to want you guys to succeed. And it, it's such a such a great time to be doing what we're doing and what we care about. And it's like if I could just take the years of experience and just here take it, you know, and go because you guys, thank you, you guys all have the ability and the desire to do it. So I, I just feel sort of desperation about trying to impart the, the information as clearly as I can and bypass the unnecessary stuff. So if it comes across as being a jackass or disrespectful, I apologize. Um, that's not my intent. It's freezing, isn't it? Here's, I mean, I... Got here. I wonder if we could all fit in my living room. This is just uncomfortable. I think you'd be more uncomfortable in my living room. <laughs> my wife and kids are all away, so I've got the, the house to myself. We could shoot pool. No, we could shoot pool and talk about this. <laughs> Cannot serve any alcohol. Don't ask. But we could we could talk about this. Really? The only thing we need to do is I need to. I, Trying to think, we'd have to like gather around my laptop. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I do. I could do that, but the the TV's in a little tiny room. The living room's bigger. No, no, we we really could not fit in the TV room. <laughs> Just try to think. I, mean, I really, I really want to talk talk through this stuff. On the other hand, we do have a midterm next time. Um, let's, let's, let me, let's see. Let's just see how it feels. And then, uh, you know what we could do? I could do the midterm review first. And then you guys could say, okay, yes, this feels okay, this feels okay. Then we could, we could can go over to my place. And, and talk about the substantive <laughs> stuff. So I'm, trying to, I'm trying to change the energy of this class. I feel as if we've got off to a bad start. So I'm trying to just say, OK, let's, let's recalibrate. And so let, let's try that. Let's look, at the, uh, let's look at the midterm review. There will be one thing on there that we haven't even, there'll be a couple of things that we haven't even covered. But I think we might be able to do this. And I think it might work. And, and, and as I said, I want to try something, something different other than standing up here and having Frustration fill the, fill the air. And we could order pizza. Yeah. And I'll buy. Yeah. How's that? In the style of O'Connell, right? <laughs> but I will, no, no, I can't see, but uh, here's, here's another thing. The stomach here isn't what it used to be, so we will have to buy from the, the naked pizza or the world's healthiest or whatever it's called. No, no. No, not Reginelli's. That's the only place my kids. What? No, no, it's not because of my wife. No, I'll get I'll get some sort of ham on it. I just it's just the cheese that I'm not dealing well with. But well, we we can can yeah. Why pizza? Why not just get a whole pig and cook it? You know. The wife's out of town. What are you doing, George? Cooking a pig in the living room <laughs> with my students. And I have no shirt on. <laughs> Talk to you later. Call me later. <laughs> yes. Cooking an entire pig with my students and I have no shirt on. Call me later. Okay. Now this, this has to be a mutually agreed upon decision because, as I say, there are there are stakes here, uh, specifically a midterm exam that that we may not want to just kind of treat lightly here. But let's see what we get. Let's see what we can talk through it. I will also post these slides.
All right, so let's, let's do this. This will get brighter in a second, I assume. So the first part of the midterm is going to be on, on some of the more theoretical stuff that, that we covered. Wow. Um, the definition of management, all of that, that somewhat technical stuff. Um, again, I'll, I'll post those slides, but I, I feel like we, we went through that pretty clearly. This, memorize this, right? Just general, basic, first class, second class stuff. On, on what management is. Now, bear in mind, any of you had me for BA 100? Did any of you all? I know some of you did, all of you, many of you. So you, you remember those tests, right? The, 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 in the, back in the day, they were 25 questions, uh, multiple choice. So usually it'll be, be four answers. However, you're older now, I complicate the multiple choice questions where they're different. I'll give you some examples of how you can do if not A, but B, that type of stuff. Uh, remember the dimming cycle? Again, some of this stuff, as I was thinking back through the review, because of the team teaching thing, I was a little disjointed, so I'd scurry over and write stuff on the board, right? Um, but, but we're clear on the, on the dimming cycle. What does PDSA stand for? Good, plan, do, steady, act. And the point of it, Alex, what's, what's the point of the, of the dimming cycle? Why? Why do we care about the Deming cycle? What does it force us to do? Yeah, kind of get started. It, it's the opposite of, of something where you, you study, study, study. We, we, want a, we want a prototype. We want to get something out. And I think the, the music business now more than ever embraces prototypes, right? We call them beta, right? And, uh, you know, get something online. It's true of getting a band to perform. You're going to sit around in a woodshed until you are you know, tool, you know, or you're going to get out and play. So um, this is really important, and there will probably be a variety of, of questions kind of working around this. Um, you remember this, this lecture where we were talking about the different, the different kind of lenses that a manager has to work through. Don't, don't confuse this stuff with, as we should see in a moment, you know, the different types of music managers, where we talk about business managers, personal managers, and um, uh, tour managers, right? Um, and that's where this comes in. So again, this is a tricky class because we're, we're talking about business management and artist management and the way they come together. Um, this, you know, and again, I'm assuming that, that the reading's being done. I've, I've kind of assigned or tried to point you in the right direction for the books. The only thing that, that you probably have not read yet that will be on the test will be chapter two of the tipping point, okay? And that is something, and maybe that's something that after we get through this review, that's something I can, you don't need slides. I can talk about that stuff all day long while we sit on my floor and chant Allen Ginsberg or something. Um, <laughs> but so passion, connection, and capital, right? And, and the key one, the, the most important, the essential one is this passion. This idea that if I love a band, and, and going back to my book, you know, that's what I tried to drive home, that so many of, of these great managers, Burtis Downs from R.E.M., John Paluska from Fish, uh, uh, dude for who managed the Beatles, who was it? Um, no, he produced them. Uh, thank you, Brian Epstein. Uh, you know, Brian Epstein was a furniture salesman, right? But he loved the Beatles. You develop the connections of capital. <coughs> you guys, the reason you don't Twitter, you don't have a network. Who, who are you Twittering to, me, you know? You, you, you develop these networks, and then it makes more sense to kind of do that, and the capital almost always comes last. Um, so, and then good to great. Chapter one, right? Good is the enemy of great. Um, just go through these, go through. I mean, hopefully I, I've been encouraged by the fact um, that I've gotten a couple unsolicited positive comments about the book. But you guys seem to be digging good to great. It seems to be, you know, kind of, um, relevant, right? Is that, is that not true? Is that true? I mean, it's, you know, I think it's a good book. I'm not trying, I'm not going to try and trick you on the test, you know, but I do want these main points. And man, if Jim Collins is good at anything, it's just, here is my point. Let me make it 15 different ways, right? That's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to pull at. Um, so think about, you know, what a good, what a great companies have. And remember there was a kind of 
the kind of whole list of things, this is not it. But I did put up a list of, of great companies versus good companies. Yes, we remember those slides? I remember doing it. Somebody nod, just kind of, yeah, okay. Um, and again, I'll try and go back and pull all the slides that, that I've used so far. Um, how did that happen there? Okay, then we spent, uh, we spent a good deal of time on the contract, right? The way the course is going, in my mind, is, is some general kind of overviews, what you need to be a manager, some general management <coughs> kind of theory, and then, as I'm in here to the Deming cycle, let's get into the doing process. Well, in order to do, you need to have the pre-contract discussion. So in this, in this stage, what are we trying, remember I said there were a couple, two things that you needed to really drive home in the pre-contract discussions. What were they? They both ended in alignment. Value and, so good, value and expectation. They're going to be on the test, right? Are we clear on that? Value alignment is the single most important thing. Billy and I tried to discourse about it. And then expectation alignment is where things fall apart all the time, right? Where you said you were going to do this or more, I thought you would do this. And then you're sitting there thinking, well, when, when why? <laughs> you know, you, you wanted to get signed to a major label. I hate major labels. Why did you think that you, you know? So understanding what those expectations are. And this then relates to the contract, okay? And, and I need you to go through your notes and, and have a sense of what, what all of these mean, okay? Most of them are really, really, really self-explanatory. Appointment of authority. I, band, grant you, person, to be my manager. Exclusive, non-exclusive, and that's a good question. You know, who is, who is, um, who's the dispositive part in a contract between a manager and a band uh, that has options in it, who's the dispositive party, or who's the party that can say, I'm gonna pick up the option or not pick it up? Who? No, no, but a contract between a manager and a band. You're right, there isn't one, right? If, if a band wants to fire their manager, they're gonna fire him. If the manager wants to you know, drop the band, she's gonna do that. Now the contract can put some form around it, but unlike a contract between a band and a label where the band is always the dispositive party, and the, and the I'm sorry, the label's always the dispositive party and the band never has any say, this appointment of authority gets a little weird. Manager's compensation, I can pretty much promise you there will be some sort of question like true or false. The management compensation is always 15%. What's the right answer? False. Right, and I'll make it more complicated than that. Give me an example of something that might not be 15%. Sorry? Well, that's a good, good kind of practical thing. If you're a manager, you're trying to get a band and you're just starting out, you say, look, a typical compensation would be 15, but I'm new, so 10. But I'm talking more about, I spent a lot of time trying to, yeah. Mechanicals would be something that, that if you're gonna commission at all, probably not gonna be the full 15, right? So you will need to go through your notes and figure out what, what don't managers tend to, to commission, right? Anybody wanna throw it out for the class? What won't a manager, and I'm gonna hit you with the big one. I'm glad you said performance royalties, and that's one of those gray ones. Um, and, and you're usually right, but some managers do. But there, there are two kind of big ones that, that you just... Recording advances and what else? Tour. tour support, good. So both of which are advances, by the way. Tour support is just an advance. And the rationale behind those things is you don't take money out of the band's creative <laughs> budget. Your point about performance, absolutely right. Most of the time, you know, but, but not, it's not one of those inviolate things. Um, so that gets into the gray area with kind of a tricky question. Um, you know, things like merchandise may be something that you don't do 15, you may do higher, right? Exclusivity is obvious, term, options. Now here, it's not, I don't know if it's up here or not, I'm gonna ask you what a sunset clause is in one way or the other. Are we clear on, on what that is? Someone, someone throw out what a sunset clause is. Yeah. Um, 
Perfect, perfect. Not always years, okay? It can be months or whatever, but, but exactly right. For however long, some period of time, an ever-decreasing, hence sunset, um, you know, com comes into play. We didn't really talk about blackout periods, but, but again, it's in the book, right? Um, just go back. It, it'll take you 25 minutes in the Getting Signed book. I drive home all of, does anybody, nobody has it here. I forget which chapter it is. But, you know, just read that chapter again. It, it, it hits all of this stuff in 20 pages. But a blackout period is just, for some period of time, you can't have any manager. It tends, tends not to work. Um, disputes. The, the key here, um, will you put an arbitration or mediation clause in your contract, as opposed to just letting disputes be settled how? Sorry? <laughs> how? Suit, a lawsuit. And, and there are pros and cons to it. Let's talk it through for a second. If you are an artist, give me a reason why you might not want a uh, arbitration clause. Yeah? Well, if you have an arbitration, you can't be just one of the jury, so if you don't have it, I mean, the jury can be a sympathy for the artist that's going to get it. So beautiful. Did everybody hear that? No. Sometimes you want to get in front of a jury, right? because juries have sympathy for struggling artists versus the big management team, right? So if, you have an arbit if you're an artist and a manager says all disputes will be resolved by binding arbitration, which means that they will bring in a judge, usually a retired judge or something, he or she is the arbitrator, he or she decides, and that's it, right? And, and you, as the, as the artist, go, uh, well, no, because you are a big, you're Irving Azoff in some management firm, I'm a little artist, I want to get in front of the jury and have, do the kind of David and Goliath thing. So you need to know the relative pros and cons. Yeah? I mean, wouldn't that like all depend on like, how, actually how much money was involved in the matter? Like, no. I mean, what about like your lawyer's fees? Like, what if, if it's an exorbitant amount of lawyer's fees? It's just a lot of lawyers. What about it? It is expensive to go to court. So are you saying it might be better to have one of these clauses? What, having, not having an arbitration clause in does not mean that you can't arbitrate, okay? So you can have a dispute, and in fact, you could draft a contract that says, we will have a mediation prior to any, <coughs> any court or non-binding non arbitration. We will arbitrate, try and work it out in good faith, whatever that means. If that falls, then we can sue. What I'm trying to say is you don't want to be walled off from a jury. Yeah. But your point's well made. I mean, the, the real goal with disputes is to talk it through some way so that you try and avoid going to court. So we'll say, we will, we will agree not to sue until we have done X, Y, and Z. But you really don't want to be in a position where you just can't, as, a, as an artist or a manager, frankly. But managers tend to want to, want to have it be binding, binding arbitration. When go ahead. If you're suing the record company, well, yeah, sure. I mean, you're going to throw in every claim you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the difference between arbitration and mediation? It's a great question. So uh, arbitration can be binding. You don't, you don't need to know this for the test. I will not ask you this, but it's just for your general knowledge. Mediation is a, is, a, there's a, there's a, there is a lower set of standards. So you can, anyone can kind of mediate. But arbitration typically involves judges and that type of thing and can be binding, where they say the arbitrator says this, boom, you have no further recourse. Mediation is, is not binding. Mediation, you try to get to a resolution. So we talked about that. Artist warranties, typically, the, the main thing here is you're going to represent that you don't have some other manager back in the, in, the, in the closet somewhere, right? I am able to sign into this agreement. Accounting, self-explanatory. Okay, so these are the, these are the elements there. Um, compensation and term. Again, typically 15% with some variables. Terms tend to be a year and then automatic renewals. 
with either party being able to sever the relationship with some sort of notice, right? Could be six months, whatever, and this is where we get into the sunset thing. So you might say, okay, we're gonna do a year. After the first year, we're gonna, we're gonna roll it into another year, but each, either party can sever the relationship with 60 days notice. If the, if the uh, artist severs with the manager, we will sunset the commission out over a period of X, Y, and Z. All right, this we have not covered yet. Some of you remember from BA1, who's read the tipping point so far? Awesome, yeah. Um, the artist, usually. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if the manager wants to get out of it, then, then he or she is not going to take a commission, you know what I mean? It's like, I quit, and you've got to keep paying me. Yeah. If they kind of quit, then they, they're not going to, now there may be something on the books, but the manager's not going to pay, it just it defies logic, you know. If you're managing somebody, you know there's a big payday coming, you're going to hang on <laughs> until you get that money. Uh, so level five leaders. Make sure that you, you've read through that. Can I, can I just check your books so I can see the table of contents real quick? I forget the chapters. Yeah, so chapter two. Um, you know, the big thing here, Billy is such a great example of this, the humility, right? Call it empathy, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the, the term with the most currency at this point really is empathy. It really is this idea that, that we have to be able to put ourselves in other people's shoes. So to be a great leader, you've got to have empathy. Empathy means communication skills. Empathy means um, EQ, right? Intelligence test rather than IQ. The, the great, great business leaders tend to not have over the moon IQs. They tend to have over the moon EQ. They can come into a situation and understand where people are coming from. I can't think of a more uh, important uh, quality to have than in the music business. Because you're dealing with artists who, are, who have tremendous emotional intelligence to a fault a lot of the time. They're ruled by emotion. So as a manager to come in, if you don't have humility or empathy, you will fail. Now, one thing that you also have to have is strength. Managers tend to be father figures more often than they'd like to be. The band kind of looks to them as, well, you tell us what to do. So you have to be comfortable with making that decision, but you'll make the wrong one if you don't have the empathy. So that, that's really what I'm getting at with, with this book, and certainly with, with the level five stuff. <coughs> Somebody brought up, um, you know, how can you have, a, how can you be a level five leader? But I forget how somebody phrased it, it was beautiful, but, but the point with setting up success is, and how it relates to the band is, you're, tr you're serving the band. You may need to kind of build your management company, but you have to realize that building your management company is best achieved by <coughs> setting up successors, right? It's a tough kind of counterintuitive thing. Um, and this, you know, so this is all level five important stuff. Please know this, right? This is the dichotomy. This is the, this is the thing that he, he punches at. He's, he identifies these leaders as having professional will and personal humility. So he talks about, right, the window mirror. What's that? What's the window mirror thing with, with regards to management? Yeah. Something bad happens, I screwed up. Something good happens, you look out the window and say, because of my team, right? And, and that's, that is a good example of kind of, kind of empathy. Um, here's another little tip that I use and something that, that you should use when you're trying to get to value alignment, when you're trying to understand value alignment, um, how the people you're out to eat with treat the weight people. You ever been out with somebody and they're like, oh, honey, get over here and do it. Asshole, don't want to work with you, right? And it's like, it tends to be like this false thing, like trying to show off how, 
powerful I am that I can boss around some waitress, right? Right on, dude. Um, it's a good, good indicator. So the time, you know, when you're trying to get to value alignment, go out with the band. See how they treat people, right, in various situations. Are you comfortable with it, you know? And, um, and, and, and lead, they, you, you, when you go on job interviews, by the way, this is, this is not, I didn't invent this. Uh, a, a lot of people will take you out for a job interview to lunch and, see, and watch how you treat the wait people as a, as a kind of indicator on how you're going to be at their company. Uh, core principles, right? Um, all of this stuff. Again, early kind of stuff. And, and, and be careful here, those of you who had me for, for intro, don't fall back on it. We're, we're at a higher level now. So, Understand how these things relate. Mission you all get. What's vision? How do, what was it when we think in management term, what is vision? That's more mission. Don't. Where you see the company going. So so your 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 mission what's the matter? Really? Okay, well here's how I approach it and and I'd like to see that, but what, who, what, they said that vision is what now? It's like the pure reason for existing. The it's pure like, reason for existing. I don't. Like, like the, what do they say mission is? <coughs> you don't remember? <laughs> I think you may be getting them confused. <laughs> uh, so, so you, your mission. I mean, it's okay. I believe you. Well, the mission, that's the mission is like the goal, like where you want to go. It's like the complete opposite. Yeah, I don't understand that. Anyway, <laughs> does that make sense? No. Yeah. So. Let's, let's, in this room, agree that, that this is going to be, if you've got other teachers contradicting them, defer to them. But in my opinion, the mission, the purpose, what gets you out of bed in the morning, right? Why do you care? We have this overarching desire to build a music business. And man, I can't go to sleep at night because I'm thinking about it. And I wake up in the morning ready to go. I see people using my lines online more than I'd like these days, and, and people are saying now, you know, do the thing, try and make a business out of the thing that you're procrastinating. And Sarah, I see you texting. It's okay. But, and again, it's not, I don't really even care. It's just that it's unavoidable when there's a little halo of blue light coming up and you're looking down like this. I can't, you know. Um, so, you know, that thing that you do when you're procrastinating for studying in my test, are you, are you, are you going through your old notes? From, what do they say? Well, it's literally the vision is the statement uh -huh. uh, or purpose for existing. Uh-huh. Uh, and then the mission is the goal or purpose. Who's the teacher? Yeah, that's literally verbatim. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's from the book. Yeah. That was the Huh? It does, I, I don't want I don't want to get it in it. look this the stuff people interpret it in different ways let's think of it in terms of purpose if you don't like the word mission okay your purpose the purpose idea all of that stuff your vision is how where and this may be where the where the confusion gets where you see the company going right so the mission is going to be the thing that sustains you but I like to think of it and I think this is a good exercise to kind of really envision, where am I going to be? What does my office look like? All of that stuff. Values, we know what it is. Competitive advantage comes out of doing what? There are two things to gain competitive advantage. Better than or better is different. Cheaper. Better or cheaper. And I would always go for better. Cheaper is a race to the bottom. So do something better, even if it's more expensive. And that gets us into the whole, remember all the talk about brand and brand equity? Remember? So perceived value, the idea that, that your brand can have more value. What happened? <laughs> Who did that? I did it with my mind. That was weird. I still can't figure out exactly what happened. Um, so your competitive advantage relates to kind of brand equity, right? And, and brand equity is what? What? Nobody? It's your worth. It's sort of an intangible value. So if we think about brand equity, once a band has a name, 
they can get bigger gigs, right? That's brand equity. Once a band has a name that is recognizable, you can print up t-shirts. That's brand equity, okay? That's really what we're building as managers because we ain't selling CDs. We're building up the perceived value. We're building up the idea that, that this thing, this access is more expensive, okay? This is the grail, emotional connection. I love this thing. I love this band. I love whatever it is, this sweater. Um, you combine that with the three essentials of management, right? Passion, connection, capital. You can't, you can't lose. You can't. It may take you some time, but you cannot lose. Find that thing you love. It's the thing that gets you out of bed. Envision where you're going, right? Have consistent values and then do something rad. You win. Okay, we haven't gone over this. This is for tonight. Okay. Stockdale Paradox, what is it? Covered it briefly, it's in the book. Very good, something like that. It is <coughs> chapter four, so you guys should have read through that. Confront the brutal facts, but never lose faith. Well done. Uh, and what that means is, right, this is Stockdale, remember he was the guy that was trapped in the POW camp forever. And if he didn't confront the brutal facts, if he tried to envision, I'm not really in a hole in the ground, I'm <coughs> in my comfortable chair, where he would have lost his mind, right? So he had to say, no, I'm in fact in a hole, but I'm getting out. That's the record industry. We are in a hole, but we're already starting to cl climb out. How it applies to business, it means that you have to keep that expectation alignment in order. It means also, remember our little chart that I drew? The measurements and stuff, and the idea behind it being in the olden days when sound scan numbers just went like this, now we can apply this, this paradox to much more hope. If we have 10 email addresses this week and we've got 15 next week, that's a net gain. The old days, first week sound scan numbers, 1,000. Second week, 500. Horrible, right? This gives us hope. We can build that up. Start collecting email addresses now for your band, for your management company, whatever it is. You'll thank me two or three years from now when you have thousands of them. You think they're insignificant when you have hundreds. You get over a couple thousand, it's not insignificant anymore. And it's only going to get more significant. Gaps, right? Remember, this is the thing I said, this is what the final exam is going to be, right? or the final project. You must give me a series of goals, setting the gap, and action plans to do each of them. So I'm not sure how I'm going to frame this in the test exactly, but it's going to be on there. This idea that, OK, we have to create specific goals. Now, one thing that I know will be on there, what is the best type of goal? An attainable. Attainable but difficult but attainable. Difficult but attainable. Goals that are too easy, people blow them off. You don't do them, right? Hey, I need you to go and uh, you know, get, uh, I don't know, I can't think of one. Something really easy. People just will think it's so easy, I won't do it. <coughs> it has to be something that represents some sort of challenge, but isn't so hard that people also go, that ain't ever happening. And that's the manager's job, a series of these difficult but attainable goals. Back to expectations. You want to write this down. Goals should be participatively set. I do not believe participatively is a word. However, you know what I'm saying. You need to set these goals with the entity that you manage. If you don't have, as they say, buy-in, it ain't going to happen. You as the manager from top down going, you do this, you do this, you do this, that ain't going to work. And yet management is defined as getting things done through other people. So you are, in fact, the little chess master, I suppose, but only if they buy into it or else they will turn the board over. Right? Hurricane, right? You guys used to do that and you're playing Monopoly and you were losing really bad. Hurricane. <laughs> the board. 
Nobody ever did that? That happened in my neighborhood all the time. We'd be playing the game, and the dude would be like, hurricane, oh. Uh, first who, then what, right? Chapter three? Maybe it was tornado. What? Is it chapter one? No, it's three. Chapter three. First who, then what goes right back to value alignment. Now, I'm going to go through the damn book. It's all, my copy's all underlined all to hell and find some, some specifics in there. So definitely want to reread. Hedgehog, what are they? What are the three circles? Come on, guys. The three overlapping circles. What you love, economic driver, and what you can do best. <coughs> Eventually, it's going to be what you can do better than anybody in the world. Right now, it's what you can do best in relationship to all the other stuff that you do. They have to overlap. What's important, tell, and this is a question, what is important about the hedgehog concept? What does it force you to do? Sorry? That's part of it. Once you've identified those three things, you make choices. Because it, it forces you to realize that just because you are the best kazoo player in the world, you're not going to make a living playing kazoo, I don't think. Maybe you will. I don't know. Right? Just because you're passionate about playing guitar, if you suck, you're not the best at it. You're also not going to, you see what I'm saying? Just because you make a fortune doing something, but every day you get up and you want to hang yourself, that ain't going to work in the long term. Stock traders are, are some of the most uh, um, psychoanalyzed people in the world. They make a fortune, but they're miserable. It doesn't last. You got to find that balance. So the, so the test question will be something along the lines of, I don't know what it will be, but I'll try and get to the point of, the three circles, really, it's not just, it's not just, oh, do what you love, make money. It's, yeah, I do love this, but it, I got to make compromises. It's about compromises. And that goes against what parents and everybody else tells you as you're growing up. Oh, just do what you love. Right? You got to make choices. So class discussions are fair gain, fair game. This chart, I probably haven't talked too much about it, but, um, Let's talk about it now. Let's memorize. Everybody clear on this chart? What it is? I can't even read that. Can't read it. Mavens. Okay. Early adapters. Early majority. Majority. Late majority. Late adapters and death. I'll say it again. Mavens. Early adapters, early majority, majority, late majority, late adapters, and death. And the point of this chart, as we'll see when we talk through, through tipping point, is that it's in this area where we have to operate. Right? We don't have the capital to operate up here at the beginning. This is, this is the purview of car companies, beer companies, people that can just blast stuff out. We have to be in here. We have to identify trends. We have to identify new bands. We have to identify new business models. And we have to do it before everybody else does and blast them up here. <coughs> it doesn't do you a lot of good at this point to be I mean, you got to be on Facebook, but you don't have any competitive advantage because everybody's on Facebook. Had you been on Facebook down here, great. Having a blog now, yeah, you got to have it, right? But the chances of you getting a lot of readers now when blogging is up here is much, much less than it was five years ago. It just is. Right now, if you want to be on the cutting edge of technology, unfortunately, this means that you will be on what? Oh, no, no. What is that? What is it? Oh, Don't say it, Jared, just because you heard it in the other class. 
Nobody, really. The most cutting edge technology out there online. Chat roulette, which is, of course, not what it should be called. It should be called, who's been on it? Just a couple of you all. What should it be called? Or, or more abbreviated, penis roulette, right? That's, that's what it, you know, my limited experience with it. It's penis roulette. Yeah, th it's, this is this makes a big difference when you got a picture. I'm sorry. Exactly. Not really the Jonas Brothers. I've seen it written about. It's, this is what I'm saying, but it, that's not the Jonas Brothers. Here, let me let me talk about this for a minute, and let me let me just for those of you who have not yet been on it, don't, okay? I, this is what I was worried about. It 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 will. I don't know any of you very well. It will offend every one of you. If it does not offend you, get help, okay? It is the apotheosis, the internet taking to its logical extreme. If we believe, and I have to be careful because I used to say this, we come online for connection. I can't say it in this context. I have to now say we go online for connection. But chat roulette, roulette has taken away any and all barriers, okay? You pop up, you got a camera on your computer, even if you don't, you pop onto that site, Within seconds, you are ostensibly connected with somebody. What you do with that connection, and the internet, as the internet does, because of the low barriers of entry in the Wild West out there, it races to the bottom. This thing's been kicking around for a very, very short period of time. It was invented by a 17-year-old Russian who started it to communicate with his 20 or so friends randomly. Who does that sound like? Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. All of the innovations online are connection. eBay isn't about <coughs> selling stuff. It's about the stories of people that, hey, really? You like this shit too? Let's buy and sell, right? With limited exception, it's about connection. Chat Roulette has taken that and said, screw it. No business model, no nothing. Now, he does have four ads under there, and he says, as of now, those four ads are sustaining this thing. I looked at this for the first time about a month ago, and there were about 5,000 people on it at any given time. Okay? I checked before I came down here, there were over 35,000 people on at any given time. And I believe that the only reason there aren't hundreds is because the servers can't handle it. So what does this say about us? I don't know. As a people? What? So you, you go to a website, chatroulette.com, OK? You, no, we cannot. <laughs> you would be horrified. And if you would, it's, it's horrifying. So you go to the website, your camera turns on, there's a picture of you, and your voice. You hit next, somebody pops up, who is also connected. We don't know. Anybody online with a camera, this is the thing. As I said, it should be called penis roulette because apparently the vast majority of people online are guys wanking, right? <laughs> But you hit next, and then it cycles through, and it cycles through. Now, I spent some time on this, and I connected with, with some people. I said, well, where are you? And we talked for a while, but eventually, I just got grossed. I just don't want to see this, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I mean, I don't have, you know, I, but I just don't want to see a bunch of penises, you know? Um, <laughs> they've tilted the camera down, dude. <laughs> 
No, it's too. You don't know who you're gonna get. Dude, I was on doing research in my office until I became horrified that somebody. What are you doing in there? Nothing. Just looking at penises. Yeah. Yeah, we all have a friend. No. I got this friend who loves it. No, I don't know. No, no. There's already a site like that that is specifically for penises. It's gay social networking. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me one bit. I have a feeling they're going to have a hard time competing with chat roulette at this point. <laughs> but um, in any case, you had, yes? Well, I was going to say, have you heard like the biggest thing with Fortnite right now? The people trying to rob the houses? Yeah. That's, that's way more hype than reality. People used to say the same things about when you bought a computer. If you left the box outside in your trash, you'd get robbed, right? But no, so the thing with Foursquare is, hey, I'm, now, I'm at such and such. I'm the mayor of so and so. And so now people are going, great, I'm going to go rob you. <laughs> I know. I think but that's, like I know. There are websites that are devoted to penis, right? There are websites for everything, right? Um, so ch I don't know how we got on this horrible topic. Um, oh, the one thing about this, and I wrote about it a while ago, and my hope was, <laughs> more penis, my hope was that, that somebody would come up with a way to sort of wall this out, because the technology is cool. If, if you really were on a site of people that were like-minded, and you wanted to you know, just kind of randomly connect with them. I thought of doing one for Day Trotter, but then I thought, you know, what's going to happen? <laughs> you know, the penises come marching in. Um, in any case, what what it does? What? I mean, that's going to die down eventually. It it will it will eat itself if they don't. I don't know, man. I mean, that's what people say about everything. That's at the oh, Twitter's a fad. I mean, it, it's it's yeah, so I'm, horrible. I'm talking about all this misuse. I mean, the misuse. Either the misuse will take it over and everyone else will leave, or, but see, there's no way, like you can't, I mean, you can ostensibly hit, report inappropriate behavior, but if you did that, all you do was, you know what I mean? Like, they're gonna have to mobilize the world's population to police this thing, you know? No, it's totally random. I, I you tell me, what? Yes, as soon as you see whatever that you don't like, you hit click and go to next. The problem is it's just a steady stream of things you want to hit next on at this point. But your point is well made that, that yeah, it won't sustain like this. But what it does do, in my opinion, and it's, it's here, but it's going fast. And what it does do is it makes Facebook look lame. Right? Yes, but this, and this is what I mean, that the innovation takes place down here. Somebody, I think, maybe you, will come up with an idea that will catapult this, because you're right. If, if they don't do something about the, uh, the ridiculously offensive content on there, it's never going to cross over you know, any, any particular threshold. But it does, I promise you, as offended as you will be, there will be something compelling about it for you. You will think to yourself, I'm going to go check that out again. And they go, ah, what did I do that for? My eyes burned out. Um, and then you'll check it out again. There's something about it. It's, it's, there's the connection thing, and it makes other websites look lame. And it's the first one since Twitter that I felt that about. You know, there's something here. But it exists in this space. So my point is we need to understand this space and do just what you did. OK, this thing, chat roulette, there's something about it. In its current form, it's going to stick in here. Now, in here, you can make a fortune. If dude decides to put some ads on there, unbelievable amounts of money could be made on that in this little niche. Okay. But if you want to blast it out, you've got to get over this adoption gap. Okay? How long has it been up? I don't know the exact, not long. But it's doing the hockey stick, right? It's doing that thing where it kind of and then kaboom. And I've been involved with sites like that, and it's a beautiful moment. What's so funny? Come on, I like it. What? 
What? I hope so. Maybe that's the unintended consequence. Um, what? What is the silent insinuation? <laughs> Give. What? So, bands exist in here, right? How do we get a band that has 25, 30 fans to jump over this? Think of bands that have, right? <coughs> Vampire Weekend was down here. Now they're up here somewhere. Why? You know, my theories, Arcade Fire, uh, Little Wayne. What causes them to jump? And then when they start sliding down here, right? So the line I usually use is, if Facebook is kind of here, right? Why did MySpace fall down here? And typically, things start falling off here in pop culture when mom <coughs> does it, right? So when mom got a MySpace account. But the problem is, doesn't seem to apply to Facebook because not just mom's on Facebook, but grandmom's on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. So for some reason, he's kept it up in here. But we go back through here because of innovation. We, we do something that allows us to slide back. If we don't, we fall over. Google's in a weird spot, right? So you get up here, and you've got to look for companies down here to buy in order to keep you somewhat relevant. In any case, the goal for all of us, because we're all here, is to cross. Yeah? What do you mean by Google bug crap? It's horrible. And it's, it's confusing to me because these guys are super smart. They thought this, I mean, you would think, you know, I mean, there, I have two, two feelings on it. One, they knew exactly what they're doing and we just haven't kind of figured it out yet. Two, they screwed it up royally. Google has, does have a history of throwing stuff out into the world in so-called beta. But Buzz is just a mess. <coughs> I mean, I'm ready to turn mine off. I don't, what do you think of it? I hate it, I hate it too. I can't it's Twitter. It's, twi it's friend feed, if you're familiar with friend feed, in your Gmail. And it just like, it's, it's not quite right. The scarier thing that Google's doing is that they're saying they're not going to support Google Docs on any other browser except for Chrome. So they're forcing you to Chrome. I like Chrome, but man, you know, better, better become fluent with Chrome. Google Wave was another just disaster. Now, some, do you guys use it? Because I know some students use it to take, take notes in class. I know you can't do it in here because I don't let you use laptops. But I have heard that students in classes will set up a wave and everybody kind of take notes at the same time. Makes sense. Or it's great for uh, pirating emails. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. How, how would you do that? I, I don't know. I, I never got <laughs> out, but I think you can just upload it. To, Could be. Upload a folder and people can just load it. Really? interesting. So are, are we kind of clear on this curve? I will tell you that there's only one, there are two ways to cross here. This is called the chasm. The chasm between the early adopters and the early majority. Things, things get stuck here. Anybody who's had me before, what are the two ways? If I remember. So to cross, you have to either improve somebody's life without them learning new skills, Remember this? Yeah. Or do something that's 10 times better but causes new skills to have to be learned. Got it? Yes. In order to cross the chasm from early adopters to early majority, you have to do one of two things. One, improve somebody's life by 10 times. Two, improve their life without them having to learn new skills. Let me give you some examples. The DVD player is the second type. The DVD player is the fastest adopted technology. Not, the internet's the fastest adopted, but, but piece of electronics in history. Why? It's the VCR, but better. Anybody had a VCR, and everybody did got a DVD player and immediately knew how to use it. And it made their life better. The iPod is an example of something that improves your life to a factor of 10, makes your life so much better, but you have to learn new skills. 
If we plop down, especially the first version of the iPod, if you remember, just with the scroll wheel. So here, check this out. It's, you know, there was a learning curve. But it was so great that you were willing to invest the time. Chat roulette is an example of, you say, improving people's lives, but there ain't any skills that you got to learn. You're on it, you're going. I don't understand why everybody doesn't have a Netflix account with the direct TV thing. It's $8.95. A month? $9 a month? For unlimited movies? What is this apropos of? Are you just mad about people not having them? You're like Andy Rooney. I don't like old people. Wait. It's, it's awesome. It improves your life drastically. Yes. But, but, but Netflix has been widely adopted. It's going like, it's growing like crazy. It doesn't, tends not to happen overnight unless you're chat roulette. Apparently, unless you've got penises as part of your, your plan. Uh, but, but, but the Netflix thing is, uh, it's, it, that's growing very fast. What's allowing it to grow is bandwidth coming down, yeah. you know, before that happened. But, but think about that. Think about, because Netflix was here back when they were just doing mail, and yet what did he call the company? Chad <coughs> Didn't call it Mailflix. Called it Netflix, because he was anticipating that they would cross the chasm. Pandora crossed the chasm. Why? I'm sorry? It sold How did it sell out? That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. So you guys don't like Pandora anymore? We love Pandora. Who does not like Pandora? Who, who likes Pandora? You know, I, don't, I tend not to use it either for that reason. Just too much. Rep now, you can help that along with, with certain preferences, but. We're kind of not the market for it in a weird way. We were originally, but I think it's people that are, and these, by the way, are standard deviations. I think, I think if, you know, if we're on the extreme end of music fanatics, which we are, right? I think Pandora is for people, and, and take away all this, this is just standard deviations, that are, that are a little bit closer to the median. It's for people that, that you know, eh, music's cool, but I'm not a fanatic about it. In any case, it, it crossed the chasm Why? Easy to use. You didn't have to learn any new, it's like, you know, radio, essentially, but it's a little easier to use. What really made it explode, however, was when, when they put it in um, huh? the iPhone app and then put it, and that's what I was going to say, in devices. The iPhone app, and then they've also got, you can get DVD players with Pandora built in. And soon, what's next? cars, and then kaboom. Questions on this? <coughs> okay. So, what I've told you about so far, you feel com comfortable with? Okay. Um, I'll give you a choice. I can probably get through what we need to get through in terms of the, the other stuff on the midterm, tipping point and um, some demo recording, that type of stuff, which should be very basic, and I'll fly through it by 8 o'clock, and we can get out of here. Choice two, we can take a break for 10, 10 minutes and then come back and do that. Choice three, I'm happy to have you all over to my house. I don't know what exactly we do over there, but we can do that. So who wants choice one? Just work for the next half hour and get out of here. Choice two, take a break. When will we get out of here to take a break? Well, 10 minutes after the break, I guess. Ten, I mean, ten, huh? Pizza. No, I'm happy. I'm, I'm more than happy to buy you pizza. But I'm thinking. I'm thinking, however, that by the time we order pizza and get it there, we're looking at eight o'clock. Should we do that another? I mean, this is a standing offer. The only problem I think. So next week we got the midterm. Post midterm party. We should what now? Yeah. No, that won't work. <laughs> Well, as long as you need, but probably no more than an hour. Exactly. 
Do you want to have pizza after the midterm or before the midterm? Before the midterm. How about before the midterm? Show up, get fed, take a test. Well, no, there's, there are two minds of that. One, I think one of the reasons why this class sometimes sags is the energy level, because I think everybody's hungry. So, you know, um, I'm happy to get some pizzas here before the midterm next time, if that's the thing. Yeah? And we can have a little conversational review. OK, fine. Then, then let me, then do you want to take a break now and take 10 minutes and then I'll finish up or just keep, keep plowing through? Let's go. All right, but you guys got to work with me though. Where are you guys going? But absolutely. But, but I need you guys to work with me and, and I feed off of your, your energy, so. Let's take 10 minutes. I mean, everybody's going to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. Down, down the way? No, it's still a maggot. By bottom top? Yeah. No, nothing here is acceptable is exactly right. What? Where's that? He owns what? What? Really? want butter on my crust. <laughs> All right, I'll probably go with slice. What type of non-alcoholic beverages? What type of non-alcoholic beverages? Coca-Cola? Okay. Sprite? Surge. Uh, Surge. Uh. All right, while I have you a little bit, let's go through this stuff. This stuff will be the, the tough, the trickiest. I don't think it's tricky, but the, you'll at least have to memorize some stuff here. So the three rules of, ec of an ec epidemic. So the tipping point is still relevant. Gladwell has fallen out of favor, okay? Uh, for whatever reason, and I know him personally, and I think he's a good guy, and I think he's a brilliant thinker, but he's, he's sort of become um, not taken seriously. I think that happens when you sell millions and millions of books. Um, and the argument tends to go, his information is too anecdotal. In other words, he just kind of tells stories. There's no hard data behind it. Fine. You can say that about Blink, I suppose. You can say it about Outliers. This stuff works, and that's all I care about. If you get your head around this, it's prescriptive. You can say, OK, I get it. I'm going to use some of this stuff in my, in my work. So he takes the idea of an epidemic, right, a flu, and says, what can we learn about that and apply to social situations? What's really interesting to me in, in what chapter two about is, is, is this, the, the exceptional people, right? And we know who these, these exceptional people are, maven, connector, salesman. And we'll talk about them in a minute. What's interesting to me is technology has allowed us to compress those things. When Gladwell wrote the book, he identified specific individuals. You, because of your love of music, because of your passion for finding ideas that isn't driven by a, a monetary gain, but simply because you love doing it, you're a maven. But maven, you tend not to be good at sharing stuff. You find lots of cool stuff. You tell your close friends, but you're not terribly social. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Yep. It's me, right? One of the, one of the uh, Myers-Briggs test questions is, when you go to a party, do you come home feeling energized or fatigued? Who in here comes home feeling fatigued from a party? Amazing. That's a classic sign of an introvert, right? I come home and want to curl up in a fetal position in the corner, right? Um, we don't, introverts, it, it just stresses us out to go to parties and stuff. We don't handle that well. There is a correlation between kind of artistic, creative mavens and introverts. So necessarily, us introverts aren't connectors, okay? So Gladwell said, look, you mavens, you people that, that would rather 
be by yourself discovering things, however you do that, and sharing it with a close handful of friends, you're never going to spread an idea too wide. You need another exceptional person, a connector. Those of you that come back from parties feeling energized tend to fall in the extrovert category and tend to be closer to connectors. And we all know people like this. People that on a Saturday night, you call them, they're going to always know where the party is, right? They're friends with all sorts of different groups. While most of us have a closed circle, and there's a magic number that we'll talk about, that circle that we can have, connectors have their feet in lots of different worlds. And when you spread information to them, they can get it out to places that you never could. Right? They're a hub on a spoke. The last person is the salesman, the person that can actually finish the transaction. We'll talk about each of them in a little bit more detail. But my premise and what, what I want to get at, because on our syllabus we're talking about technology, and believe it or not, I'm actually bringing it back to this. And you must also know, and I didn't really do the review, but the technology is an accelerator chapter, uh, which is seven. Simple, simple concept, but do read it. So I believe through technology, we've managed to take these three things and smash them together, and here's how. Introverts can now become very, very good bloggers and very, very good connectors via technology. I am way better on technology than I am in person. I'm way better on Twitter than I am in person. It just suits me better, right? And because of this, I, my shortcoming, my deficit as a connector, as being an introvert, is no longer a deficit. It can now kind of blow out there. And this is beneficial to all of you. All of you that get fatigued from coming back from a party, probably you jump on Facebook or whatever. And you're much more comfortable that way. Finally. We're at a place now where we can also be the salesman. We can sell right from our website. And we break that wall, that uncomfortable wall that we've all had to do at one, one time or another, of selling something when we're not natural born salespeople. I do believe that people can learn most anything, but what they can't learn is to be a salesperson. Does that sound right? Who's done sales? I bet you're pretty good at it, man. Do you like it? because you're passionate about it. Could you go and sell watches? Well, maybe. Is there anybody who just loves selling something and could sell anything in here? Usually I've got one or two. No? You know people like this? Yeah. It's really quite extraordinary where, where, and I've been there. I remember I started a little company that, that sold, I recorded the London Symphony Orchestra, because it was all public domain stuff. And, um, and created these, these CDs. And they were all, it was, it, was, it was for charitable stuff. But so I created CDs like Merlot Moods, Cabernet Classics. And I would take them to beautiful covers, take them to wine stores, high end wine stores, say, put this up on your counter, see how it does, right? And it did great. Sold the company, made a bunch of money. But I remember the first time of walking into this wine store, I was, and this is after 20, or 10 years, 15 years, whatever, in the music business. I was so nervous about going in and talking to the buyer after I got out of the, the meeting, in which they bought my stuff, I vomited, okay? I hired someone soon thereafter who got a, a almost inappropriate thrill from <laughs> selling stuff. She just loved it. She, was, she would knock on any door, you know, that's what you want as a salesperson. Now, in traditional, kind of pre-modern, post-industrial or pre-industrial industrial society, that's what you want. Do we want that anymore when you, the creator, <coughs> tend to be selling? No. This woman was great because she'd break through the doors. But then I'd have to go in and say, look, yeah, she's kind of crazy. Here's what we're really doing. And just like you, you can sell those records like crazy, but if they pulled you out of that context and so said, sell something that doesn't really work, so the salesman, in my opinion, becomes sort of less relevant in this situation where you, the maven, making the thing, finding the thing, connecting it in a way that's not distasteful, and then closing the transaction, that's huge. 
but the point still applies. We have to create a context, right? And so much of this, for you guys, it's about creating that context either online or in a web presence. And I really mean this. When you're thinking about your website, and we've talked about it a little bit, we talked about it the first day of class, what is that thing about certain sites, not chat roulette, but other sites that make you want to come back? What is the context? Can you build something that people will go, OK, I am in a context that I want to buy at the show. Can you transform the room to make commerce feel more natural? And in the book, he talks a lot about this. We know this, right? But again, with technology, word of mouth gets all hyper accelerated. Think about this in the in in you know tandem with technology as an accelerator, because the message of that chapter is technology can accelerate you up or down, depending on what you throw into it. So word of mouth can expose you up or down, depending on what you put into it. Think about how you manage your online presence, because it is essentially word of mouth on steroids. So these are the people that, that these rare gifts. And again, this is a summation of the tipping point. But filter it through what I'm saying, if you believe me, that we can compress these roles because of technology. Connectors, maven, sales. Mavens. How many of you all identify yourself as a maven? Most of you, I would think, right? You love something. This goes back to mission, your purpose. What is that thing that you are an information specialist? If I want to know about rock steady music, who am I going to ask in here? Right? There are a couple of you, right? A couple of you. And you guys are specialists in that. Each of you have your specializations, right? And you want to share it. It's why you devote time to going down and spinning records. You're trying to share. Remember, the internet is about sharing information, telling stories, OK? The internet is just college radio writ large. You do it because you care. There's not a financial thing, believe me. If it was a financial thing, I don't think either of you guys would be in love with rock steady. You're not going to get rich off rock steady. Maybe you will. I don't know. Ernie B's done OK, right? Um, but you want to, there, there's this teaching thing, too. Don't you see that? When you sit down with someone maybe, and you feel that bond, and it's that thing that you're passionate about, you want to turn them on. It's why we make mixtapes or whatever the, today's equivalent is, mix MP3s, right? Let me show you this thing. It's why we put that crap on our wall on Facebook. Let me turn you on to this thing. Click this link. That's what mavens do. Connectors have a different set of brain synapses. Rather than getting jazzed about a thing, they get jazzed by people. And I love this. About, it was one of the many reasons I married my wife. I struggle with people, if that's not abundantly clear. She can go into any situation and just charm people. She like, you know, it's not that I don't like people. I just, I have a more, she just, it's just easy for her, right? Some of you, that's the case. You, you're, I can see it. You could go into a social situation and do it effortlessly and with ease. That's a gift, by the way, right? We all have to sort of overcome it. We learn language for one reason and one reason only, and language is hard. You think it's not an amazing, amazing thing that a two-year-old learns language? Why does she do that? Why? Yeah. I know you're giving me a hard time, but you're still right. No, to, to communicate, for empathy. It's not for food. It's not for any of the, any, you know, you're a baby. You're getting what you need. You're getting your diaper changed. You're getting your food. And yet we force our little tiny baby brains 
to do something so hard. You want to know how hard it is? How many of you all are struggling through some language course right now? Right? It sucks. And yet, little baby brain says, damn it, I'm going to figure this out because I want to communicate. We don't ever lose that. And connectors just do it better. And then finally this, the salespeople, right? And I've been doing it a little bit tonight in class to prove a point. I've been doing more verbal stuff to see if I could get you guys doing it with me, and I've done it. You found yourself nodding more than usual tonight? That's because I've been doing it at you. That's a sales technique. You're buying a car, you're buying something. You think I'm wrong? You probably do it, you know. You nod, and then you get the other person nodding back at you, and all of a sudden, <laughs> it, I don't like it, it's manipulative, but have you ever found yourself in a, in a situation where you're, you're in a store, and you end up telling a salesperson details about your life that some of your best friends don't know? <laughs> you're a good salesperson. It's also the context, right? The context of your store is one of creativity, one of, wow, this is a secret special place. I'm going to tell those secrets and hopefully it leads to purchase. Great salespeople get you into their world. And this is what I mean about the compression of technology. Build a website, play a live event that transforms something ordinary into your world and they will buy. I don't want to harp on this example, but it's why Daytrotter works. It transforms your website into a world that you go, wow, this is cool. This has context. This has something that I want to participate in. I want to understand this. What is the story? You have to figure that out. It's the little details, right? And this is, and this is, why, I say, this is why I still teach this book 10 years down the road. He really nailed it on this one. I think it's probably more than six at this point because we're so bombarded. This, remember when the tipping point was written? Kind of pre-internet. I mean, the internet was there, but it wasn't like it is today. I'd put another number, another zero, an order of magnitude there. I bet we're hit with something like 2,000 impressions a day. I don't know what the new stat is. Certainly don't memorize that 254. I'm not going to ask you. It. It's there to make a point. Six times you do probably want to remember. Because I want you thinking about, OK, I want somebody to go to my website, come see my band, download my music, or whatever. How am I going to touch them, virtually or otherwise, six times? What are the different techniques? Because if you think by playing your music or exposing your music to someone one time, it's going to work, you're crazy. In the old days, we used to do this through co-op, you know, with a variety of ways. We'd put a record out. Before the record came out, we'd buy some ads, impression one. Somebody's flipping through a magazine. We didn't expect them to buy from the magazine, but we expected it to be an impression. Impression two, you get it on the radio. Impression three, you get it reviewed somewhere. Impression four, um, it would be in a, in a co-op bin at the store. Impression five, it'd be playing overhead. Impression six, there'd be some coupon. And finally, you'd get a buy, or the band would come through town or whatever. That'd be the sixth impression. It's a lot of times. Think about the stuff that you buy. Now, what shortcuts this is what? What makes you buy it, huh? Word of mouth. Somebody says buy it. What is it? I don't know, just buy it. Trust me. OK. So these little things, right? We underestimate context. We attribute things to the broad picture and underestimate the context. And the anecdote that he tells in the book is the tetanus shot one, right? Where people, everybody said, you have to get a tetanus shot or vaccine or whatever it is. Everybody ignored it. They sent out flyers. Go get a tetanus shot. It's important. To college. Nobody does it. How'd they finally get people to go get a tetanus shot? Put a map on it. A map to a, direct, to a place that everybody knew where it was. But that presented the context. We need maps. It's why the good websites work. Yes, we all know how to use a website. Give me a map. Make it clear. Make, strip it away of the unnecessary choices. Strip stuff away. 
The iPod works because of the minimalism. God help us, chat roulette works because of the minimalism. Imagine what it would look like if Microsoft had built chat roulette. You guys have all seen that um, iPod designed by Microsoft? Have you seen that? Not the Zoom. <laughs> there was a parody commercial of, uh, I'll show it some other time, but they, they show what the box of an iPod, which if you remember is just uh, the older iPods, it used to just be a you know, five by five box with like, uh, uh, what's her name? Janis Joplin or someone on the cover and, and very little text. And then they designed it if Microsoft did it. It's all these system requirements and stickers and everything. It's So you can't really create a community. That, I should change that slide. You've got to organize the community. The community exists. There's a community of rock steady fans out there. They need organization. There's a community of people that are predisposed to like the music that you make. You've got to help them organize. So replace the word create with organize. You must organize a community around the things you market. You can't build it. You can't make people like stuff. They exist. They already like stuff or they don't. Help them to organize, right? Find these, and this goes back to our little chart here, our normal distribution curve. Find the small groups with large amounts of power. <coughs> And think in terms of this number. And it's a good number for bands, right? 150 is roughly the number of fans that you can have in a market before something has to start happening. If you are playing in a band and you're playing house parties, clubs, or whatever, and 150 people are showing up, something's going to happen it probably means you're about ready to explode up to another level. Because at 150, you're going to naturally have people that are connecting to other circles. So think about it. You play some club in New Orleans, 150 people come out, and you blow them away. Chances are some of the people there aren't in your circle of friends. You can't have 150 close friends. I don't care how cool you are. That means you're starting to spread outside your circle and other circles begin to create. Does that make sense? I really like this number because it's a good, difficult, but attainable goal for you band members. It should be your first, goal, first number metric for all sorts of stuff. Email list, Twitter followers, Facebook fans, 150 and then build it from there. You can do that. Can you get 150 people to a show? Some of you probably can, but it ain't easy, right? So if you're drawing 150 people in New Orleans, something's happening. Strive for it. The best example that I can give you to understand weak ties, semester's coming to an end. You need a summer job. All spring, you've sat on the couch with your buddies talking about jobs. Nothing comes of it. You get on a plane, train, whatever. You're sitting next to somebody. You strike up a conversation. You tell them what it is you want to do, and they say, what? I know, I know somebody. somebody you should talk to. Why does this happen? It happens because you're a closed circle. You and your friends all know roughly the same information. They're not going to be able to help you get a job because you know the same ones that they do. You need a loose tie, somebody that you don't know, somebody that has no connection to your circle who goes, oh yeah, let me be a link, a linchpin to a whole other world. And we need this for music to spread too. If only your friends are listening to your band's music, you've got to have some loose tie that sits in between them and spreads it to their circle. Okay. The internet, again, it accelerates this, although I'd say this happens offline a lot more easily. 
I get inundated with requests from students to uh, connect on LinkedIn with me. Not going to happen, guys. I know why you're trying to do it. And I don't really use LinkedIn, but I, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to you know, accept you as a friend. I mean, I'll, I'll accept you as a friend on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but not on LinkedIn. Because that's my circle, right? And if I gum it up with people that, that aren't, you know, that are college students, it's, it becomes not a relevant circle anymore. But you all want me to be that loose tie to expose you to the other. Now, I will write you recommendations. I will introduce you to people. I don't have context on LinkedIn. That's why I can't do it. This is, I guess, the part in the class where you think I'm an asshole, but I'm not trying to be an I'm just saying it won't help you, it won't help me. However, you need a job somewhere, I know somebody there, I'll, I'll help you, but, but anyway. So, the more connected you are, the better you are. All right. A lot of this, okay, I, I promise you I can, give me, give me 10 more minutes. I think I can get through this. <coughs> Let's talk about recording a little bit. Again, we're talking about technology. You guys know a lot, probably some of you know more than I do about recording. I've done a lot of it. My points on this are recording, it's not a class on recording, it's in terms of management, okay? You as manager are going to be in a position where you are going to be taking a role with the recording. Your role is going to be able to get that thing done for a limited amount of money so that you can sell enough of the thing to make another one. That is our goal as artists. Sell enough or monetize in whatever way the thing that we make in order to do it again. Repeat. That's our goal. So one thing is leveraging this. You guys all know, you don't go pay $300 or $3,000 a day or whatever. You do as much as you can at home as possible and then go bring those files in and use their Neumann, use their you know, piano or whatever. I'm gonna post these slides but I'm gonna skip through them. I put a schedule up here on here for, for recording. It's in my book as well. You by no means need to memorize it, um, but I'll post the slides. It may be helpful. Again, you guys do this. So, you know, just some little tips, right? And again, you don't, you don't need to write this down, but just stuff that I've seen, you know, over, unless you're my morning jacket, kind of be careful of the reverb. You do want to spend some money, and I wish my morning jacket would go back to reverb, frankly. Um, you do want to make sure that there's not big peaks and valleys. Um, and then vocals. Vocals tend to get buried for some reason. Okay, one thing that we do need to talk through. So the recording thing, again, the goal as a manager, get something. If we're thinking about the dimming cycle, in order for you to get gigs, you need a recording, period. Sonic bids, all that stuff, I don't think it works. I really don't. I think you've got to make a recording and you've got to burn it onto a CD and you've got to put it into a package. And this demo is not going to labels and all that crap. It's going to a club or going to a frat house or going to a non-traditional venue to create a dialogue, to get people talking back and forth. And then once you've got that gig, that demo is going to local press and that gig is, uh, that demo is going to local radio to create a dialogue. And after the, after the midterm class, we're going to do this. We're going to break up into a bunch of groups and we're going to plot out in a circle from New Orleans at the hub where we can go. And we're going to do some damn research because I see too many of you guys making music in New Orleans and never getting out at all. And if you would just look into a club, Baton Rouge or wherever, what is the market there? Can you go and play a gig there and then come back a month later? You got to do that or you're going to be like every other band or artist in New Orleans that never breaks out. 
Who are we sending it to? Not labels, right? Who are we sending it to? It's a conversation, it's communication. It's who I said, gigs. Get the gigs, and when you got the gigs, support the gig in press and radio, not with the intention that they're gonna review it, but to get your name in front of them, and maybe after the third or fourth time, they come out and see you and you can talk back and forth. Because if you're thinking it's gonna go to A&R people, right? How do we listen? Same way you guys listen. Some song comes on, goodbye, goodbye, right? Don't, this will be a test question. Who is the last person you should be sending a demo to? An A&R person, a label, right? Anybody gets that wrong, you should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, let's see, how many songs? You want it to be a dialogue, four, okay? You need a number four. The problem with four is you can't sell that really. So you give it away. I really, really think you're playing gigs, burn up a bunch of CDs, give two to every person with the mandate that they give it to a friend that isn't at the show. And if it's four songs, that's enough for people to dig it, get something in there, write on the CD for more. Send us your email address or come to this website, give us your email address, we'll give you the other four, right? Make it participatory. Four songs is enough to get you the gig, four songs is enough to, to send it to radio stations, to send it to local press, and to give away at gigs. Three, four, whatever. By either signed Wilco, by the way. This is a problem. Put 12 songs on your damn thing. I love the first song. I hated the next 11. Guess what, I didn't get to the next 11 because by song two or three, I was tired. You give me three great songs in whatever context, I'm a booking agent, I'm whatever, I'm calling you up because I never hear three great songs. You give me three great songs and nine bad ones, you're like every other band. You want this demo to just start a dialogue be it with your fans, with booking agents, with whatever. And as manager, you've got to impress this on the band. And the, the band is going to want to record a double record. They are. That's what bands want to do. And maybe they should, but you should dole that out over time. If you are a band that's got lots of different styles, do you try and put together some sort of demo that showcases them all? He signed the Pixies, my friend Peter, right? To, to, you know, commit to a style and do it emphatically, right? I don't, I don't, you don't want to do, as he says, at least initially, the first argument wins out. Then you can become, you know, Radiohead. But do your first thing in a style that people can go, okay, I get what these guys do. Talked about this quickly and cheaply. Again, as manager, if you're spending more than this, you're crazy, crazy. And I think you probably cut that number in half. So the manager, right? One thing you can't do, and remember, this is a little counterintuitive. If you're a manager, you gotta have that passion, right? Well, you can't be obsequious. You have to be supportive, but not everything my band does is genius. It ain't, right? Time management. Your role in the studio context is time management, okay? Balance, you've got to supply the balance. All of you guys are well positioned. You could all walk into a studio and you're not gonna be lost, right? You don't have to describe things. Oh, I don't know, it sounds too wet or too, well that's not the right term, too bouncy. Um, so what do we put in this package, right? These are the elements. Something, some recording, right? A bio, we'll talk about bios very briefly. A photo, not on a roof, not on train tracks, and not in front of a brick wall. <laughs> this is the single most important item in my opinion, right? Are you playing live? I know that's a catch-22. You can't tell you're playing live until you are playing live. Play live. 
some sort of press clippings, and then a personal letter. People hate feeling like they're on the, how do you guys feel when you're on the back end of a, of a, of a mass mailing thing? Throw it out, personalize. This is a conversation tool. Yeah, where you've played. Now, the, I mean, if, if all you've played is the same venue for the past six years, that's not a tour itinerary. <laughs> but you want to show that you're playing. This is particularly true when you're, when you're trying to reach out to prospective, like, you know, booking <laughs> agents, that type of stuff. They've got to see that. If you don't have this, don't bother reaching out until you're there. And, and I hate, I don't even want to bring it up, but labels too. No one's going to sign you unless you're torn. They just can't. Talked about this. I guess we're done. All right, guys. See you next week.